without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Tom Romer. He is a veteran, he is living in the area, and he has a lot of experience in communication, in um, protecting the president, in presidential communication, so we're gonna really have our ears on today. Please welcome Tom Romer. Thanks, Peg. Uh, I mentioned to a few people I should change the name of this presentation, get the word cold out of there. Uh, it seems it's always in clement weather whenever I give this. The first time I gave it was uh, in Iola. Uh, in January, it was 27 degrees below zero. Now we've got snow today. I think there's an omen there somewhere. Uh, as Peg said, I, I'm living here at, uh, in Wapaka, moved back here three years ago. Born and grew up in Appleton. Uh, left Appleton uh, at about age 21 to join the military. Um, I guess the, the theme for this is you never know what you're going to get into and get involved in. Uh, a witness to history, I guess, is, a, is another term that I, I can use. I never knew uh, anything about these bunkers. I never knew anything about presidential communications. I was this you know, kind of naive 21-year-old uh, from Wisconsin going into a whole different world. I guess the first, um, first mention of the, of the Cold War was in a speech given by uh, President Truman, March 24th, 1947. They were in the midst of kind of recouping after the Second World War, and they started looking at uh, their relationship with uh, Russia, in particular the Soviet Union, seeing that things were going not too well for the United States uh, in that relationship. Being proactive and having been through war, they decided, well, we need to do some planning for the continuity of government. I guess that's another term that, that I can use here. Now, I'll be throwing out a, a few TLAs. Uh, you know what TLA is? TLA is three-letter acronym for three-letter acronym. Because <laughs> the government runs on TLAs with CIA, FBI, NSA, all those, you know, they're all letters. But I'll try to explain them. Um, in, in particular, well, let me see, I should get it right here. All right, one of the first things that was proposed, um, was proposed by uh, Truman and then was carried out by uh, President Eisenhower was the establishment of a relocation, relocation site for the Pentagon. They needed to have some sort of protected site uh, for the military in case of a nuclear attack. They knew that Russia had already exploded a nuclear device and in 1951, they decided that they needed to start building these, these bunkers. This, is, this and Cheyenne Mountain, you've all heard of Cheyenne Mountain, were the two first bunkers that were built uh, for the protection of the military. The primary site first was up here in, outside of Blue Ridge Summit, Pennsylvania. And it was uh, codenamed Site R for Raven Rock. The, uh, Geologists supposedly uh, determined that the rock in that area was uh, a volcanic rock that was the fourth hardest rock on the face of the earth. So it was an ideal site. It was 75 miles from Washington, D.C. and about a 30-minute helicopter ride. So they decided to carve the mountain out. They carved out about a quarter of a million square foot of, of rock. They built in to that several buildings. Uh, they started out with three and eventually wound up with six. The, uh, in, the, in the meantime, uh, Shangri-La was being used by uh, President, and it was renamed, uh, of course, Camp David by President Eisenhower. And that was located right there. You can see the relative short distance between the underground Pentagon and Camp David. Since the president spent a lot of time at Camp David, it was natural that there needed to be some communications between those two sites. In addition to that, there were a number of sites that were then added in case main 
routes went down. You could get a, a circumnavigated route through some other areas. And a lot of these were, uh, were towers that were, that were built. The um, Military Command Center, National Milita Military Command Center, NMCC, was uh, established in Raven Rock along with the AJCC, which is Alternate Joint Chiefs of Staff. So the military had a great presence there. It was uh, serviced by Fort Ritchie, Maryland, which was just down the road right about in there. Uh, Fort Ritchie originally was uh, a, a base that was used by the military to train um, interrogators and um, infiltration troops during World War II. So it was kind of a not very well-known base, but it did have all the amenities that uh, regular bases have with the PX, commissary, and, and billets for the, for the military. Now, there are a lot of presidential needs uh, for information. In particular, the, the president now and at that time carried the codes for nuclear, nuclear bombs. So there had to be a communications link between the military and the president at, at all times. That was the premise for what I will get into later. Um, there were other agencies then, after these two places, Cheyenne Mountain and Sidar, were completed, um, where the, the government built bunkers uh, to take care of members of Congress and also the um, executive staffs. Uh, in particular, one of them is now used by FEMA as their, as their base of operations. As you look at some of the code names for these places, Crown is the White House itself. It's located under the east wing of the White House. Uh, still there. That is uh, the base of operation for the military communications. There was a, an underground cable from the White House to a site called Cartwheel, which I'll show you some pictures of in a minute. And from there, it, there was microwave communications through Damascus, which is near uh, Fort Detrick, Maryland, up to Camp David. From there, alternately around to Camp David. And a third way through Corkscrew, which is now used by the FAA, through Camp David. So there were multiple uh, methods of, of communication, but it was all microwave. At that time, there was no satellite. Uh, it was just getting into the infancy of, of, of satellite. Here is uh, a topographic map of Raven Rock. Fort Ritchie is kind of a no, uh, misnomer here because the Fort Ritchie was actually located uh, somewhat away. This star over here uh, is actually where I served most of my time. This was a separate communication site. There was uh, hard wire communications between AJCC and us and we provided all the links then to Camp David. This is an aerial view of the site. Now this is located just off of Pennsylvania Route 16 uh, between Waynesboro, Pennsylvania and Emmitsburg, Maryland, about 30 miles south southwest of Gettysburg. And there's some information up here about uh, the bunker from one of the Pittsburgh papers if you'd like to read that after, after the presentation. These are the two main entrances to the mountain itself and I'll show you an overlay in the next, in the next shot. So all of the carving was out in through this, under this area. They had their communications tower, another communications tower up on the site, uh, up on the top of the site. <coughs> Alternate entrances. This was a local road, Harbaugh Valley Road. Entrance was here. And right here is the entrance to the site that I was primarily assigned to. Can't really see that. And up on this little knoll is where the, uh, where the tower was. Now, I, I have to say that most of this information was 
uh, taken off the internet. So if any of you would like to pursue any of this information further, um, there's a, a, f a fellow who used to work at uh, Camp David, his name is John Cross. He has a very good blog. And if you Google um, WACA, W-H-C-A, cannonball.blog, you'll be able to come up with a lot more information. So a lot more than I can provide during, during this hour. So here's the main entrance. Purposely curved like that in case of a nuclear explosion, the shock wave would potentially go in and out one way or out through here and then out the other way. So there was an intention for that, uh, that way that they carved it out. These are the areas where the buildings, interior buildings were built. There were three-story buildings. And most of them housed uh, services. Two of them saw, housed the services for the military. There was a cafeteria. Uh, there were bunks. Uh, there was enough food supply for, I think, about six months that was stored in there in case they needed to. They did have a domestic water reservoir, drinking water. And they also had industrial water reservoir for heating and cooling and those, those specialties. One of the jokes uh, at Fort Ritchie was that uh, as MPs were brought into the facility to uh, work at the facility, one of their first uh, duty assignments was to go to the edge of this reservoir. And they were to guard the reservoir and look for submarines coming from <laughs> Camp David. And that was a joke, it really was, because there is no such thing. Supposedly, some fable said there was a waterway dug between Camp David, and if the president needed to come and pop up, they were the ones that were going to greet him. <laughs> this is an aerial view of those two portals, Portal A and B, with the main visitor center there. The normal procedure was you would come in through the entrance, be checked by the MPs to make sure that you were allowed to get into the site itself, and then go to this building where you would then exchange passes and then take a bus into the, the site itself. This is the, uh, a, a better view of the area where I primarily served. This tunnel entrance here was um, consisted of a blast door about uh, five feet thick. Uh, several blast valves that would uh, close down to cut off the air handling system. There was a thousand gallon diesel fuel tank there and there were two huge caterpillar generators that were located just within this area for emergency power. Um, every once in a while we would uh, have to pull maintenance with the uh, Navy CV who was uh, the primary caretaker for the site. And then we'd have to walk up about 60 yards through a tunnel and we would arrive at the tower itself. <laughs> this tower in particular was the only one that uh, was almost completely underground. We only had two floors above ground, primarily just for line of sight to Camp David for our microwave shots. This is a cutaway view of the tower. Um, it was about 30 feet across on each floor. And primary entrance down in the, in the front through the, through the tunnel. And there was a decontamination room in case uh, you were exposed to uh, nuclear fallout. You had to decontaminate when you came in. Sleeping quarters were on the second floor. Third floor was uh, a mess hall, kind of a kitchen area. Fourth floor was administrative. Fifth floor was uh, communication, was uh, supply. Sixth, seventh, and eighth floors were communications. Primarily single sideband on six, uh, the uh, carrier gear, uh, teletype and telephone carrier gear on seven, and then there was the microwave equipment itself on eight. And you can see from the earth line right here, that was the only part that was, uh, was visible. Everything was covered with a plexiglass layer that, that was especially treated with paint that would pass the uh, uh, microwave communications through there. 
just a couple of antennas on top, some of the high-frequency communications uh, for the presidential limousines and uh, for the uh, Secret Service, and a couple of uh, single sideband antennas. There was also a little thing on the top called a nuclear blast detector. And the purpose of that thing was to be able to uh, recognize the intense pulse of uh, a nuclear explosion. And it, would, it had a 360 degree view, but primarily I guess if they dropped the nuke on Washington DC, it would be able to detect it. We worked 24 hours on, 48 hours off. And one night about 8.30, 9 o'clock at night, we had full maintenance on the equipment and uh, my coworker and I were sitting in the administrative office uh, watching television, and all of a sudden, everything went black. The bell started ringing. We looked at the control panel on the, on the fourth floor, and we saw that the blast valves had closed, that the generators had come on, and within 10 seconds, we were back up on power. So the first thing to do was to try to establish communications, but I decided, well, I'm going to be a little more proactive. So I picked up the telephone. I got a dial tone. I called my wife <laughs> to see if anything was going on outside. She said, oh yeah, there's a real heavy thunderstorm out here. And I think it, there, there was a series of uh, lightning strikes just close enough together that the detector thought it was a blast. I didn't tell her this until a few years ago. <laughs> now, um, the primary uh, government agencies, or the uh, primary military agency was called the White House Communications Agency. And it was originally um, put together in 1942 because uh, the president needed some communications, and I think it was mostly during travel because a lot of train travel was done at that time. And Roosevelt needed to uh, have the military again being command. There's a decaying railroad car up in, I think, Chambersburg. It's either Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, or um, somewhere up in that area. That was the original car, and you might be interested in, in doing a little research on that. Um, there are some people that are trying to bring it back to its original condition and put some of the equipment in and, and put it on display. But that was the start of the White House Communications Agency. The primary mission was, of course, communication support, but in addition to that, historical documentation. All of the uh, presentations that the president gives, whether it's press conferences, whether it's um, uh, speaking to the American on a, uh, America on a, a, a special night or something, or at events such as um, will be recorded in uh, China where he is right now. All of those have to be recorded for historical purposes. So the White House Communications Agency does that. They're responsible for setting up the podium, for putting the microphones up, and making all the, all the communications links back to the recording devices and then providing that to the National Archives. They also record all Air Force One communications. Um, several years after I left the military and spent nine years with the Secret Service, uh, we would go to the uh, recording uh, group, walk up recording group at the White House and see if they had any tapes that they had erased, degaussed. I got a tape and just for grins, I decided, well, I'm going to see if there's anything left on it. So I started playing it. And it was, uh, I think it was uh, like 1,800 feet of reel-to-reel -reel tape. After about two minutes, I got into it, I realized this was all of the communications from Andrews Air Force Base with Air Force One the day that President Kennedy was shot. Oh. And what was very interesting was about three-quarters of the way through, um, the pres uh, President Johnson, who had just taken the oath of office, called uh, Mrs. Kennedy, uh, John Kennedy's mother, and gave his condolences. And she referred to him as Mr. President. 
Um, so it was a very interesting, it was a short conversation, but very interesting. And uh, I've seen some people say that uh, that's a very valuable tape, so I'm not going to tell you where I live. <laughs> now, here's kind of an interesting shot. This shows, this is an a photo, a aerial photograph of Camp David. And this is the president's house at Camp David. This is the tower, codenamed Cactus, which was similar to ours, only it was completely above ground. Back up over here on the, on the top, you can't really see it too well, is the tower above Site R. So you can see the relative length of distance between that tower and Site R. And we were just over, back over on that little knoll over there is, is where our communication site was. Now, there were some other recording systems, and not necessarily for historical purposes, but were done, I guess you could almost call it surreptitiously. President Kennedy had a recording system, and there are tapes available uh, for review uh, from his library. President Johnson also had a uh, recording system put in by the White House Communications Agency. He had asked the Secret Service to put it in, and they said they didn't want anything to do with it. So they asked the military. They said, OK, we'll do it. He had a recording system on his telephone in his presidential office, another recording system in the um, uh, cabinet room, and there was a third recording system up in his private quarters in his bedroom. He had controls located at each site so that he could activate it whenever he wanted to. This wasn't, you know, 24-7. This was just on demand when he wanted to record it. And I think some of those um, recordings are, are still public knowledge at uh, the LBJ Library in, in Texas. Now, an interesting book was written by uh, Bill Gulley, who was the military uh, office, or director of the White House Military Office. And in it, he has a couple diagrams. Just so happens that uh, one of the diagrams uh, in here uh, was put together by a workmate of mine. And uh, last time I saw him, I asked him if he would sign it. So he did autograph the uh, copy of the, of the diagram for the uh, presidential recording system, the LBJ's recording system up in the presidential quarters. Now, I mentioned Crown, which is the White House, Creed, which is our site, the site that I worked at, and Cadre, uh, which was a site inside Site R. All the communications from Site R, as I said, came out hardwire underground to our site, but there was also a presidential relocation site or a portion in Site R. It was um, it had a very nice office, nicely appointed presidential office with a big high back leather chair. And about the second day that uh, I, I was on duty, they took me for a tour. And of course, we went through all the gyrations of getting in, exchanging passes and identification and all kinds of things. And we walked down through the comm center, which was also part of the, of the building. Excuse me and went up to the presidential quarters. At that time, it was uh, LBJ. Um, they did have all, they had three changes of clothing for all members of the family. So not only for the president, but for Lady Bird and for the two girls. There were bunk beds, uh, enough for 12 people so that he could have some of his staff there if he wanted to. But the most impressive thing was in the presidential office itself. Walk in and nicely appointed drapes along the, along the side wall, ceiling about like this. And uh, the master sergeant who was giving the, the tour went over to the side of the drapes and pushed a button. The drapes parted. And here, two stories down below was what I would call the war room. It was the Joint Chiefs of Staff war room with all the communications consoles and the maps and everything else, and quite impressive. So it was 
within real close proximity to the, the presidential quarters. And again, because there was a, enough uh, food there at, at Site R, um, if the president needed to be relo relocated there, he could certainly be there for six months or so. This is a picture of uh, Cartwheel. It was called, code name, code name was Cartwheel. That's at Fort Reno, um, just outside on the northwest of Washington, D.C., just off of Wisconsin Avenue, of all names. And this was, this was being built uh, in 1956 or 57, I do believe. So it gives you a pretty good idea of the size of this whole, of these towers, which people thought were water towers since it was at a water reservoir. This area underneath was, again, communications, uh, consoles, was um, a, uh, if, if the president couldn't make it out of town, they could come there and there was also some, um, some relocation site uh, bunker facilities for him there temporarily. Cutaway view, basically about the same thing, but this, this shows the areas underground that were uh, primarily for uh, people and the, and the communications. Again, basically the same thing, all the communications on the upper floors and the antennas, the antennas up there. This is corkscrew that was in um, Lambs Knoll, Maryland. You can see there are some high frequency communications antennas rotatable for single sideband. There's a smaller one back over here which you can't really see too much. Um, this also had underground facilities for uh, personnel. It was turned over and is still in use today. It's turned over to the FAA. Uh, I don't know what their use is for it, but uh, I'm suspecting that the area underneath is primary for communications and for uh, computer facilities for the FAA for their, um, their plane guidance, as well as this new building that was built over here. This area is, uh, was called Crystal, and it is on the front range of the Appalachian Mountains, directly west of Washington, D.C. It's now used, uh, let me backtrack for a second, this area underneath is all bunker. It's primarily used now by FEMA, and it is the um, headquarters and operations site for FEMA in case of any national uh, disaster or <coughs> military disaster. This is one of the um, relay sites. Cannonball is a, yeah, it's Cannonball. It's located up near um, Mercersburg, Pennsylvania. Primarily just to take the signals that were sent from the other sites and then relay them back around on that backdoor uh, route to, to Crown. It also had the capabilities though of uh, remotely operating uh, single sideband. And back in those days, single sideband was the primary communications for long distance. Uh, we had transmitters and receivers located at almost all the facilities. And in, in one particular instance, when uh, President Johnson was in Punta del Este, Uruguay, our site was the only site in a three-hour window for five days that could get any communication. So we had to man the site, and we had to man the single sideband radio for uh, that particular time, since that was the only emergency communications that we could get uh, to that site. Now, not only was there the microwave, but to service the microwave, we had uh, teletype and we had voice communications equipment. We also had what was called secure voice, which is the encrypted data that comes out for the military to the president. We also had uh, one channel of video. So if the president was inside R and he had to address the nation, he could go to their studio, he could, uh, they would 
fire up the cameras there, they would connect with us, and then we were the primary link via microwave through Camp David, and then back through the route either to Washington, D.C., or to um, the Lambs Knoll facility, which was an AT&T setup at the time, and they had connectivity uh, nat nationwide into the, uh, uh, to the networks. <coughs> After uh, Vice President Humphrey and um, who was it uh, Edwin Muskie lost the election to Richard Nixon, they took a vacation at St. John's in Virgin Islands at the uh, Canoe Bay Plantation run by the Rockefellers. And I had the pleasure of going down there about three days in advance for a 10-day visit. And we had uh, single sideband communications as our emergency. We also had telephone lines that were set up, but single sideband was our primary communications back in emergencies. So we had a portable unit there, uh, uh, I think it was a 75 watt, 175 watt unit. And we'd make radio checks every day, sometimes twice a day. So I had educated my wife that if she ever got a phone call and at the end of my uh, sentence, I said over, that she was then to talk, and when she was finished, she would say over. So I'm, I'm, I'm on this link, and I had gone through Camp David and asked them to dial a local number, and she was home at the time. And I was telling her, oh boy, this is really nice down here every day. It's about 85 degrees, it's sunshiny. One o'clock in the afternoon, a little cloud comes over, and there's maybe a sprinkle for half an hour, and the sun comes out. You know, water temperature's about 80 degrees. It's clear, it's beautiful. And after I had told her about this and said over, there was this pause, and I thought, well, maybe she didn't remember what she's supposed to do. <laughs> well, it seems since that was in November, the end of November, beginning of December, um, it gets cold in Pennsylvania. And that area was subject to a lot of ice storms. We lived on the side of a hill just down the, uh, about maybe a half mile from the uh, Appalachian Trail. Oh, there was an ice storm overnight. Our car was parked up on top of the side of the hill and there was a kind of a long slope to get down the hill. She couldn't get out. So she was a little bit uh, perturbed that I'm telling her how nice it is <laughs> down there in uh, the Virgin Islands and, <laughs> and she wasn't uh, too pleased with that. <laughs> Thank you, dear. Thank you, dear. <laughs> now, this, this is just a little information on the White House Communications Agency. Um, originally known as White House Signal Corps, that was uh, the original designation when uh, President Roosevelt had his uh, had the uh, the car, the railroad car with the communications in it. Um, Mentioned Shangri-La, now known as Camp David. Secret, Secret Service is the primary beneficiary of the communications systems that the White House Communications, that WACA, uh, provides. To this day, um, they still provide that link. I'll show you a picture later on of a, a car that's called the Roadrunner that's now completely modernized, it has satellite communications, but it also has encrypted data for the communications between the Secret Service themselves and, uh, and the White House. There's also um, secure voice that's available for that and secure internet through that traveling car. So, but originally, um, back in my time in the 60s, when we were on a trip, there was this box that what they called the Molt. And any of the, remember the, uh, whenever you see the president at the podium, he's got two microphones. Yeah, it's kind of in case one goes bad, the second one is going to pick up. But they essentially bring those feeds into the Molt, and then the output over on the right hand side goes to the major networks or to any of the other people who need uh, an audio output. And that was the, the primary, primary road. Um, equipment that, that was used by White House Communications. This is a, a picture of the microwave setup in the tower. Um, ceilings were at about 10 feet tall to accommodate all of the rack and cabling and the interconnections between the two. But primarily there was a, a voice communications system 
there was a teletype and secure communications, and then there was the video communications. <coughs> so we had three systems up all the time running, and there were three backups in case uh, we had any problems. Complete patch panels up here so that we could patch in between the, the, the different systems. This is the um, teletype and the uh, voice communications interfaces. We had 24 channels of uh, telephone that came through here. Um, this is the primary, this is the spare. These are the amplifiers for the uh, teletype and then the patch panel that we could patch anything through, including the uh, base stations. Now the primary communication still with the Secret Service is handheld radios, <laughs> FM radios. And uh, these were the, uh, were the three frequencies uh, base stations. These are uh, 250 watt base stations that were present at each location. This is a single sideband setup. The receivers for the single sideband system and sometimes when uh, things, when we had finished our preventive maintenance and we're just fooling around, nothing to do, I would go up and listen to um, people communicating because this was primarily an amateur radio frequencies that were being used and I'd you know, listen to guys talking from you know, all around the world, different languages. Uh, so it was, it was kind of interesting. One thing I will say about the, the training in the military is that all of the different equipment that we were introduced to and worked on, although I was primarily trained on microwave, was very beneficial because that led to my ability then to um, become a security specialist with the Secret Service for nine years after I left the Army. And then after that, after I left uh, the government service for 35 years as a technical security consultant. So a lot to say for the military and the, and the very early training, um, was, it was very good. And it got me started on a road to do something. This is the transmitter we used. It was a primarily a fixed 1,000 watt transmitter. Now it's basically AM amplitude modulation, the same as any AM radio station. Uh, with just a little different frequency spectrum on it. This was our travel kit. This is what I talked to my wife on. <laughs> this was the little KWM2. It was primarily an amateur radio unit, but we adapted them and used that uh, as our emergency communications whenever we were on the road. This is a picture of the command post, the Secret Service command post at the Eisenhower Farm in Gettysburg. Part of our responsibility was also to service the communications uh, for the Eisenhower Farm. This is available on the tour. If you ever get to Gettysburg, take the tour of the Eisenhower Farm and you will be able to see the, uh, the old command post. This is the way it was back in the 60s, exactly. Um, two monitors for, fixed for the cameras, one monitor for the camera on the gate, the, the front gate, couple radio low, low wattage transmitters, um, the old push button call director telephone, binoculars, notice the ashtray. <laughs> mm -hmm. There was smoking allowed. And then there was a kind of a amateurish alarm system that was built uh, actually by the Secret Service and put in there many years ago. But it, it served its, its purpose. Isn't this beautiful wallpaper? <laughs> there was another facility that was built at the time, and no, no one really knew about this till about 1978, 79, when a uh, reporter from the Washington Post wrote an article about this. This is the entrance to the bunker under the um, Greenbrier Hotel in White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia. You know about that. Yeah. <laughs> it was the primary relocation site for members of Congress. So you figure 535 members of Congress, if they could get that many people in there, plus their staff, plus support facilities, it was a huge complex. And it basically went unused and nobody, nobody really knew about it. Now you can take tours of, of the place. Uh, but that was, uh, that was something that uh, had been in effect for many, many years, and this, it, it, it was hardly ever visited anyway.
but it was there. Again, figure how much money the government spent on the Cold War just to build these bunkers alone, plus all the other things that went on. It's a phenomenal amount. Most of our transportation was done uh, on C-141s. The uh, uh, Military Airlift Command out of Dover Air Force Base would fly into uh, Andrews Air Force Base. We'd load up the planes with our equipment on pallets, racks, and take off. Uh, only one incident was really scary coming back. Oh, the plane was also big enough to carry one of the presidential limousines. And uh, of course with the webbing seat, if anybody's you know, flown uh, Air Force planes, you know there's a webbing seat along the, along the side, very sparsely decorated on the inside. And uh, we're sitting alongside and here's this limousine that's tied down in, in the back of the plane. And we're coming into Andrews Air Force Base and there's a little bit of turbulence, I guess I could say. I'm sitting there you know, going up and down like this and I'm watching the car. And of course they try to secure that car with pretty good sized chains. And we hit one pocket of air and the car bottomed out on its springs. And then it went back up, boing! And I thought, oh, thank goodness those chains held. Now, on a sad note, um, a C-130 was taking one of the uh, follow-up cars out of Denver, I think it was in the 1985-1986. Um, it hit turbulence and a car broke loose and uh, the plane crashed as a result of that because the, the car went right up into the front end of the plane and uh, the C-130 crashed. Uh, I think six, five Secret Service, one White, White House Communications and um, the two pilots and the uh, navigator were lost on that. This is the car that I, I call, I talked about, it's called the Roadrunner. And you might take a look for that sometimes in one of these uh, presidential motorcades. You can see up on top there, it's got the satellite communications device there. But again, this is the primary interface from the presidential limousine, basically uh, secured Wi-Fi, if you, you know, want to use the term that goes from the presidential limousine to this car and then it connects back up by a satellite to you know whoever they need to connect to. Um, the um, secure voice, there's secure voice, there's also the uh, Secret Service communications which is now encrypted so all their radio communications is, is encrypted now uh, didn't used to be, and that was one of the downfalls, I think, to what happened at uh, the Hilton Hotel when uh, Reagan was shot. Um, they didn't use communica encrypted communications, and um, Hinckley heard clear voice that the president, or that, um, what was his name? I forget the code name, uh, was on his way down. So he knew and moved up into this unsecured area and shot President Reagan from there. After that, there was a big move to go to encrypted communications so that uh, people wouldn't be able to hear, overhear any of, the comment, any of the communications. And anybody with a FM radio, standard FM radio receiver from Radio Shack could have picked up that information because no encryption on it. Uh, we're getting close to the end here. Uh, oh. That's it. <laughs> um, just a, a small sidelight um, on my journey to the White House communications. I was in basic training, I think it was about three weeks into basic training, and uh, the company clerk drives out during uh, one of the uh, PT sessions. We were out doing exercises and getting all built up. He comes out and talks to the drill sergeant, drill sergeant stops everything, he says, uh, Private Romer, um, go with the company clerk. Okay, so I went to the company clerk and this guy's kind of giving me the eyeball and he says, uh, I'm supposed to take you to battalion headquarters for a White House interview. And I thought, oh, that sounds kind of neat. <laughs> so, went there, uh, took me into the battalion headquarters and <laughs> sent me down this hall and I was waiting for about 15 minutes. Finally, somebody comes out in civilian clothes and, and asked me to come inside. 
So there were about six people sitting at tables similar to this. They were all in civilian attire, and they were introducing themselves as colonels and sergeant majors and uh, um, Navy chiefs. And you know, I'm figuring, what the heck is going on? So they, they explained what they were, what, who they were and what they were looking for. And apparently, because I didn't have any record of any criminal activity or anything like that, uh, they, and I had two years of college education, they figured, oh, this guy's potential material. Um, I had originally enlisted for microwave school. I, I wanted to go to microwave school. And when I had my little uh, congratulations letter from the President of the United States saying that I was selected to join the military, um, I went to the recruiter and asked him, you know, what can I get? And I said, I want a microwave. So I went down and took the uh, pre-induction physical, came back and I said, well, can I qualify for it? He said, yeah, you can get anything you want. He said, however, microwave school is filled up for a year. So you want anything else in electronics? I said, well, what do you have? He says, well, how about this one? He says, 52 weeks of school at Fort Bliss, Texas, Nike Hercules Internal Guidance Fire Control Maintenance. I said, okay, sign me up. So I enlisted for three years. So therein lies when I get to the to, uh, basic training and I get to this White House interview, I told them that, you know, geez, I originally enlisted, I wanted to enlist for microwave. Can you use a mic, can I get into a microwave school? I said, it just so happens. We have plenty of microwave sites, we'll get you in. So interview was over. They got some additional information from me, went back to basic training. And uh, uh, two weeks later, uh, took me in for a lie detector test. Uh, anybody here had a lie detector test? <laughs> yeah, very interesting, aren't they? <laughs> uh, but I passed it. And uh, two days before graduation, everybody gets orders from basic training as to where they're going to go for their next assignment. <laughs> Greg, you're smiling. <laughs> and I'm looking at the sheet, and it says, uh, Private Romer, Fort Bliss, Texas. No, that's, that's not right. So I went to the company clerk. I said, hey, I'm supposed to go to Fort Monmouth, New Jersey for microwave school. He said, you're going to Fort Bliss. He was a corporal. You know, he had two stripes on his, on his sleeve, so he had a lot of power there. <laughs> Just so happens I had an 800 number to call the White House, and I called the duty officer that night and told him what the situation was. Next morning, go into the uh, company office and Here's the clerk giving me the eyeball again. He says, I don't know who the hell you know, Romer, he says, but I got this teletype in this morning. He said, you were the only name on it. He says, uh, your orders have been changed. I said, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, it's been an interesting journey. Um, like I said, you never know what you're going to get into. And being a witness to history um, and all the events that happened started with that little thing, uh, that little White House interview, and uh, it was very enjoyable. And for anybody who has been in the military, you know that sometimes there are problem areas where you don't particularly agree with what's going on, but all said and done, I'll tell you, the camaraderie there is, is something really you don't understand unless you've been through it. In fact, we have a reunion for our old detachment branch coming up next June. We do this every five years. And we're getting to the point where we're starting to lose a, a few members, but it's nice to go back to the same area, look at the haunts that we used to uh, frequent there, and uh, enjoy the company of, of those friends that we still uh, remain friendly with. So that's all I have. If anybody has any questions, um, feel free. Yes? Well, um, most of the people didn't know what they were going to be used for. So from contractor standpoint, they were just contractors. Uh, they were just building these buildings. And uh, in particular, hollowing out the mountain in uh, Pennsylvania. Most of the local people knew that it was there. But probably, you know, the word filtered out years later that it was the underground Pentagon. And uh, but, you know, nobody said much about it.
Uh, no, there were there were no nuclear there were no uh, missile silos in the area. No. Yes. The Secret Service doesn't get the good press it got when you were in. I guess it fell apart when you left. Yeah, it went to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> in particular, I want to ask you about if, if you have some insight on the fellows who went down to Cartagena to the president, and apparently the U.S. Army told them all about the women that were available to spend the evening. Leave it to the Army, yeah. But the Army didn't tell them a key factor, which was when you finish with the woman, you've got to pay her. So the next morning, a woman was out in front of the president's hotel screaming for that Secret Service agent to come out and pay his bill. Uh, are any of them that stupid today? <laughs> well, I could, I could use a, a phrase, but I won't. Um, We're grown up. Okay. Apparently somebody didn't, didn't get the best bang for the buck. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> Thank you.